How do you follow that? Eh? <laughs> uh, two things, just uh, just to, uh, in support of, of 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 Kenny and Pat. There's a fact sheet on your uh, on your table, and that actually came out of what the the reps told us. So that fact sheet is actually, let's say the the shortened version of. Uh, the sort of the enthusiasm, the commitment that they saw at, uh, at Maranyan, and that's actually you've got hard copies here. It'll be available up on the Step Change website uh, as of as of today. But actually, more important, if you want to speak to those guys, you can actually just email them at ESR, like the safety rep at stepchangeandsafety.net, and and we'll make sure that they are accessible and uh, free of charge for anybody that wants them. You know, subject to being on short to come along and, and actually help you communicate what's going on to your workforce because that's their role they're, they're safety leaders you know they're safety reps but they're safety leaders so they have to you know play their part also so i'm going to invite uh, derek and Gilles up from eurocopter and alan and tim and we can move into the q a and um, i fully suspect there'll be questions so uh, we've allowed uh, 45 minutes for questions so we don't have to use it all lunch is coming at 12 so uh, we'll use what we need and uh, we will uh, get through that. I think just while, you know, we, we saw the Eurocopter plan, one of the things that we looked at and actually Pat raised the question, you know, how, how safe are they? Uh, in one of the workshops, uh, they have, a, like we do, boards with, uh, you know, reportable incidents and LTIs. The last, uh, in, in one of the production facilities, the last reportable incident was 766 days ago, based on where we were there last week. And that was a minor cut in a hand. There was no reportable LTIs. So, you know, that, that gives you a sense of the calmness and the output of that calmness and what, what, you know, the benefit in terms of safe working. So, you know, as much as the technical content of the visit, we actually sort of probe just to see you know, how good the engagement and how good their safety performance is. So, so any questions? No? Anybody got anything? Yeah. Or, sorry, on you go. Yes, I just, we've got a microphone for you there so everybody can hear you. Hi, sir. John O'Hara from Shell. Um, in the Southern North Sea, we actually um, operate an EC155 fleet. So it's more a question about how does this particular issue impact the fleet that we're operating at the moment. Maybe it's a question to Derek. Uh, John, uh, for the what, there's no... Um, we have no indication today that there's any cross impact on any other uh, Eurocopter helicopter uh, in any of our models. Um, so um, th we have no, uh, we have home system on the, the 155 um, and it's monitored at the same, uh, with the same uh, diligence as the 225, but there is no, uh, there's no uh, evidence of any uh, suspicion on any other model. And, and I might add, if I may, that, that that comment also applies to the earlier generation of the Super Puma, uh, I'm, I'm, as you, I, I mentioned earlier. Only a, a limited, not a large, but a limited number of the Super Puma fleet are affected by this issue because of the change in the, the material in the, new, in the second generation because of the arrival of the second generation shaft. Um, in fact, the majority of the Super Puma family are fitted with the first generation shaft, um, and the first generation shaft is manufactured with a, a different metal, a different process, uh, and this issue is not affecting that, that, that first generation shaft. And that's why you see Super Pumas flying still, not 225s, but Super Pumas uh, flying still today, uh, including in Aberdeen. Savage, I'm also from um, Shell One Gas. Uh, that begs to ask a question then, why did you not um, go back to the first generation gearbox? The, Im the impact on the business with respect to other helicopter usage is, is dramatic. Yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is the first generation gearbox doesn't fit on the 225. Um, the 225 was designed to be a much, have a much greater load carrying capacity, more passengers, more cargo, than the first generation Super Pumas. And as a consequence, when, the, when the, um, the 225 was designed and certified, it was designed with new engines, more powerful engines, um, and therefore designed with a gearbox which was able to absorb more power. Um, and as a consequence of that, the first generation gearboxes are not retrofitable, if I could use that word. We can't put the first generation gearboxes onto a, onto a 225. They're simply not 
uh, capable of sustaining the force that comes from the, uh, and the lifting capability of the aircraft. So the 225 is a new generation aircraft with a new generation gearbox, and the problem is specific to, uh, to that gearbox. Just to add one point, the, the, the 225 gearbox can and was actually fitted in some 332s. They've all been taken out and replaced with the first generation generation shaft, which is why we were able to bring those back to flight much, much earlier. So you can retrofit it, but you can't forward fit it, obviously. Yeah. Does that yeah, answer this question? Yeah. Any care? Hi, uh, Mal Fraser. I'm a safety rep from Talisman Cinepec. Uh, I've had some concern raised by the offshore workforce regarding increased burden on the operational helicopter fleet that we have in particular the S-92. Mm -hmm. Tim, would you like to just say how you're managing that uh, additional flying hours, etc.? Well, it's certainly true that the, uh, the S-92 fleet is busier than it was, uh, taking up some of the slack. But the fact is, you know, we did have some slack, but uh, that's now being used up. So what, uh, what we're seeing, you know, what you're potentially your guys offshore are seeing is that there's, there's more exposure to minor technical faults or crew sickness or anything like that because we don't have um, that, that buffer that was there before because we're trying to give what we can to the industry. I mean, this is not anything about um, pushing any kind of safety uh, standards or anything like that. These are people and aircraft that are available to operate that we are, we've been making available to the, to the industry to, to operate. Uh, it just means that there's no um, spare capacity there anymore. So any minor uh, issue, as I say, like somebody having the flu or uh, a minor technical issue with one of the aircraft, rather than there being a spare one that we can roll out, that spare one has been dedicated to, uh, to flying just until we get, uh, we get more aircraft into the system. I mean, there are more aircraft coming in virtually on a monthly basis. Uh, we're training up more pilots onto the fleets uh, that aren't you know, away from the 225 onto these, uh, these other fleets. So the, uh, the, that spare buffer capacity is coming back and it will come back. But where we are right now, pretty much uh, everything and everyone that can, can fly these aircraft is, is doing what they can. Does that answer your question? Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Gentleman up at the back there. Clear. Yeah, Kevin Buckham from SPD here. Uh, just a couple of points. One, one's an observation, one's a question. We'll start with the observation. Uh, and if I'm, I'm wrong in my assumption, then please correct me. There's a lot of people here today. We've got three helicopter operators. Other than the gentleman on the uh, board there, I don't see anybody in the attendees list from either CHC or from Bond. Okay, I'm being pointed out there's a gentleman here, but uh, on the attendees list I wasn't. I would anticipate, it as, as we're all customers of theirs, that they would have a deal of involvement and wish to participate in events like this. The fact they're not here is concerning. Do you, uh, want, do you want me to, I can, yeah. I can answer that observation. You're right, those, you know, the, you know Tim, Tim's here because he's chair of uh, HSSG. The other thing is that both CHC and Bond are part of the Helicopter Safety and Steering Group. So they sit in amongst us and, and come to the meetings. So there's not a one operator position here, it's a joint operator position. And uh, you know, they, they participate in all the, you know, let's say all the normal operations of HSSG and, and what we're doing here. So why they're, why they're not here today is, is you know, operational reasons and all sorts of other things. So we just, ex we just accept that. It, this is not about, you know, CHC and Bond know what's going on. Absolutely. This is about us communicating to the widest possible stakeholder group and make sure that you, know, you are as well informed as we possibly can make it. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. Just the showing of face yeah. to the assembled crowd yeah. here would have gone some way. The, the question I've got is about the hums, and, and I think we kind of touched on it, but I, I don't, it wasn't bottomed out enough for myself, which is live data streaming of hums. Rather than have the pilot have his focus taken elsewhere, which he's now having to look at the harms when he lands or when he's flying. Is another possibility that the data stream this back to a central location where there are dedicated harms analysts can view this in flight at all time? Derek, do you want to? Yeah. Um, 
first, first of all, there, there are many specialists in homes. The, 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 the first filter for homes data is, of course, the maintenance teams of the operators, and, and they are trained um, to, to look at and analyze homes data, and that's exactly what happens on, a, I would say, a normal, a normal basis. Um, the, the issue, of course, is that that analysis only takes place when the aircraft gets back to the, the maintenance base. Um, what the HUM system does, what the current technology of HUM system does not permit, either on our, our, our aircraft or anybody else's, is in-flight transmission, um, uh, simply because the system has not been designed for it. In fact, in the aerospace industry, there's only one aircraft in the world today that has the capability to transmit in flight um, uh, that kind of data um, back to the ground, ground station, and that's the Airbus A380. Um, our engineers are working on the next generation of HUMS, and it is the intention through satellite link that we will be able to transmit back to base, back to either front office or back office, uh, HUMS data, but the technology just does not exist today or it's not available on the, on the 225. So it has to be downloaded um, in flight rather than transmitted in flight. And we can download it either to a PC card or we can download it directly to the displays in front of the pilot. I think, but I, maybe I pass the question to Tim now, I don't think, uh, my impression, and I've been a pilot, a helicopter pilot for 33 years now. This is my 33rd year of being a qualified and current helicopter pilot. I don't think that this is a diversion for the pilots. I think it becomes an integrated part of the warning, caution and warning system uh, in the helicopter. And the pilots, frankly, the pilot's job these days is to monitor the systems uh, as well as fly the aircraft, uh, the pilots and, and the co-pilots. And I, I frankly don't think this brings an additional burden uh, to, to the pilots, but maybe you have a comment there, Tim. But uh, does that answer your question? The, 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 the answer is we don't have, the technology doesn't exist on these aircraft to transmit to a ground station back in flight, so therefore it's either got to be done on the rig or uh, back at the maintenance base or into the, inside the aircraft itself. Consideration would be to, if he's got a data card, that the moment he lands, the data card gets handed to the helidate crew, who handed the radio, right. who data bursts it back to yep. back to the base. All, all I'm saying there is, you get a greater level of detail. I would suggest you would get a greater level of detail coming back to a more focused individual, which would be a HUMS expert. Yep, and, th that, and that's a very good question. And one of the, we have a HUMS working group with the industry, uh, together with the oil and gas operators and, and the, uh, the helicopter operators. And one of the questions that we've been addressing in that group is the ability to transmit data back from the rigs. Now, actually, that's more difficult than we thought it would be uh, in terms of data integrity and in terms of, you have to remember that we've, what we're talking about here is a helicopter sitting on the rig and then the means by which data can come out of that machine down into the, the operations room, transmission, red light, green light. So we in, what we don't want to do is introduce additional difficulties for the operation of the, of the aircraft, of course. What we want to do is ensure that there is a means by which everybody on board the aircraft can be, uh, can be assured that the aircraft has no uh, abnormal vibration level and is safe for the return or for the next, the next flight sector. But it, it, you, you're absolutely right, and it is one of the issues that we have in discussion with the HUMS working group. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Another, another question there? Good morning, that's Peter Dawes uh, representing oil and gas today. And it's a question really, I think, for Gilles. Um, we've heard quite a lot about the root cause analysis and uh, the tremendous efforts you've gone to to try and identify these two causes, you know, for the two separate incidents. And I'm wondering really what confidence you might have that you will come up with a definitive root cause in the not too distant future. I don't know if I had to, to say my personal opinion on the Eurocopter opinion, but <laughs> no. I think what is important is that by end of February, as we will finish the third campaign of test, and I think we will have more more uh, visibility uh, for the future. But uh, bef before the end of February, I, I think that we, we cannot say uh, more. 
you couldn't kind of assess a probability of finding that cause, 50% or 90%. No, it would be my, only my personal opinion. So uh, it wouldn't be the, the Eurocopter opinion. So it's only a personal feeling. So I, I prefer not to share it. Mm -hmm. right, Alan, you. do you want to pick some? Yeah, I just wanted to dive in there and being an engineer, ask a question. Um, I was very interested in the, the data of the, the rotation speed of the, the rotor and that the, these two aircraft, you were pointing to the fact that they had a certain RPMs I mean, first question there was, were those two aircraft unique amongst the others that you've looked at? And secondly, what is your sense, what is your feeling that that is part of the, the whole problem here? Okay. Uh, if there is a problem with the uh, RPM, so be because we have some flight between 261 and 264, it leads to the, what we called the dynamic assumption. Okay, because it is a certain range of RPM, which is new. So dynamic, it links to RPM somewhere. Okay, so it's linked to the di dynamic assumption, but the dynamic assumption is only one of the assumptions. We, we have seen we have a lot of them. Uh, so it's, it's a track, it's a possibility, but uh, nothing uh, at this stage, uh, nothing more. Um, for the other helicopter, we have analyzed uh, a lot of uh, other helicopter. What is sure is that you need to, for seeing this kind of RPM, you need to have the right FADEC version and you need to fly it at low altitude density. Uh, something like between uh, minus 2,000 feet and minus uh, 6,000 feet. And for this kind of, uh, of uh, so not a lot of helicopters have flown in this condition with the V12 version of the FADEC, which was uh, um, fitted in uh, this helicopter. I think Peter just uh, you know to, to add to that, you know we we made some very quick root cause assumptions in May. We don't want to make those assumptions again. So the fact <coughs> is, is that when we're ready, you know you know, you know there's no probability here. It's about moving us forward in a consistent, safe, and very open manner. And you know when we get there, we'll get there, but we won't be there before that, unfortunately. Okay. Any other questions? Yep, gentleman down here. Target uh, On the fact sheet, it said 50% of the flights uh, chose not to stop flying. What have Eurocopter learned from these and any additional learnings from them? Derek, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, I, I think, Willie, thanks. Uh, I think, Willie, the first thing we've learned is that the safety measures that we have in place um, are protecting uh, the security of the flight. Um, so th the, those. Um, Operators and those aircraft which have continued to fly are doing so by applying the preventative measures and the, uh, the safety barriers uh, which have been mandated by Eurocopter. So that, and and um, it, it seems that they are providing the appropriate level, the necessary level of safety. Um, so I, I think that's the first thing that, that we've learned. Um, We've learned that there is concern amongst those operators as well, and that we've also have to continually communicate with them uh, on what we're doing in terms of the investigation. Their level of expectation is no less important than, than yours. Um, so we have continued to have a, a active uh, communication uh, process with them. Um, we have, I mentioned earlier, I think when I was speaking, we have NDT, we've eddy currented a number of those aircraft which are flying, and we have happily found that there are no cracks in them. Um, so there is a, a regular ongoing communications process, and uh, to give you an example, who we're talking about operators, in some cases they're offshore oil and gas in, in Asia. Um, there are, it was mentioned earlier, a significant number of military uh, that are flying. You, you can imagine that the, the, Fren the French armed forces are flying these helicopters in Afghanistan today, which for them is a very hostile um, environment, and they don't want to be obliged to, to be forced to, to land. Uh, and so they are taking a very high level of interest in the investigation, and they are contributing with their with their data and their information back to us. So we are trying to extract as much as we can from, uh, from those operators that are continuing to fly. Do you want, you want to add anything? 
I just just add, I'll add one thing, and, and perhaps Tim can come in. The CAA operational restriction that we have in the UK prevents us from flying over the hazardous environment. It actually doesn't prevent us from flying, let's say, over land. And there's a number of maintenance flights going on in the 225 around Aberdeen. So you 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 know you could leave here and see a 225 in the air. That's with pilots on it. There's no passengers, but we have to ensure that these aircraft are you know fit and ready to take you know take the safety measures and and the. The, the way forward when, when we get to the end point of this. And it's really important because if we don't do that, from an industry perspective, it'll take a number of, you know, significantly more time in terms of deep storage and pilot training. And it's, you know, so we, we have to be very clear about that, that they're flying today in Aberdeen, but under very clear measures. You know, Aberdeen to Peterheads have 10 minute flights, but for shake, shakedown and maintenance. Uh, Tim, do you want to, is that? Uh, yeah, that, that's that's essentially it. It's uh, it's a requirement that you know, we can't just leave these aircraft sat around. There are so many uh, components within them that are required to be uh, rotated, turned, lubricated uh, within a set period of time. Some of that we've been able to do on the ground with various ground runs, but there are some components that we actually have to fly, and it's part of the uh, you know, the approved maintenance uh, of the aircraft. So. Uh, you know, we carried out all of our risk assessments as the uh, as all the helicopter operators jointly, and in, you know, including Eurocopter, uh, and we came up with this uh, procedure for for flying the aircraft. Uh, also interesting to note, perhaps, that there was certainly in in my company there was no shortage of pilots that were willing and happy to go and fly the aircraft again. Yeah, one question there, is he? Lady in the centre. Thank you. Uh, Sonia Teachin from Gale Limited. Um, my question is right with regards to flight data monitoring and whether I know that you've been looking at a lot of the data that's been on, on the flights on the 225 and the, or, and the um, 332 and whether you've learned anything from the flight data monitoring, whether you're able to put that together with the HUMS data and, and get a better picture of the operation of the aircraft in the environment. Shields. Shield. Um, I, I think we are, we are focused uh, during the investigation on what we were looking for, so the NR, NR problem. So, but of course, uh, based on uh, an in-depth uh, analysis on flight data monitoring data, on UMS data, we could uh, perhaps find other interesting lessons learned. But for the time being, we are looking for uh, things which are related to the investigation. Yeah, I, I would just add that there are, there are some other things that come out of flight data monitoring um, with regard to the way that we operate the helicopters in the Aberdeen environment, um, which is um, specific to the Aberdeen environment and the operations here. Um, I, I don't want to elaborate on that because at the, at the moment we don't know whether those are part causal factors or, or not. But to answer your question, first of all, the operators, Bond, Bristol and CHC, have been absolutely magnificent. In their, in their contribution, they've provided all the data. More than that, they've provided analysis of their own data. It's been an open book process with the operators. Um, and, and, you know, we're looking for trends. We're looking for trends and we're looking for, you know, issues which may be specific to this, the way the aircraft are operated here. Um, and there are some things which strike us, but I, w I don't want to speculate on whether they are contributory or not at this stage. What we, we analyzed in the flight data monitoring uh, data is what is the exact spectrum of flight of the, of the operator. Uh, what, what were the, the, the power applied, is if it was MCP in level flight or MCP minus 10%. So, so it was used also uh, for this kind of thing. And when we have established the, uh, the test protocol with the different power that we have to apply, we have used the spectrum uh, used in the offshore uh, industry. Yep. Mr. Nichols. <laughs> uh, uh, Dave Nichols, Wood Group PSA. And I think you've probably already answered this question in, sort of indirectly from some of your other answers, but um, have you actually detected weld cracks in uh, helicopters operating in any other regions of the world? No. I'm sorry, it's simple. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, Dave, a nice short, simple answer for you to understand. <laughs> so, Derek, there, there are only the, the 
the two crack shafts and no other crack, no other cracks detected. No, so the, there have been. I mean, uh, so far th there's been no other report. We have, as I mentioned, we've we've eddy, uh, eddy current checked uh, almost 60 aircraft now. There's no. Uh, there are no cracks on those 60 aircraft. Uh, the hum systems, which are monitoring uh, a part of the population which are still flying, are not giving any indications uh, of any crack propagation. I mean, the simple answer is no. These, these are, for the moment, these are two isolated cases. I mean, I, well, I, in fact, I wouldn't even say for the moment. We have put in place measures now that normally will prevent, should prevent, uh, these cracks initiating, even if we don't know what the root cause is. Uh, if the measures don't prevent it, then there are safety measures in place that should immediately capture it. But to answer the question directly, no, there are no other cases that we have identified. We have broken shafts. Um, I think we've broken two. We've run two full break. Two, two, one or two. We're in the, on the second break. We have eight shafts to break. Um, in the next weeks. That's the, um, the, Gilles didn't say it, but I've heard Jean Brice say that we have eight more shafts to break uh, as part of the, the test process. So yet we can artificially break them, but there are no cases, uh, no other cases of, uh, of, of cracks in shafts uh, so far identified. Pat, do you have a question? D can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you, you answered the question anyway. Uh, I was just going to ask about the, the uh, any current testing of uh, the results for these uh, are consistent with the HUMS results that you had. I think you've answered that. So, y yes, they are. Yeah, I mean, they're consistent in that they're showing nothing. <laughs> so, you know, there's nothing there to find. I've got a question there from Kenny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks very much, Kenny Lang from AMEC. I'm just reading a quote from Bill Chow's Chief Executive <laughs> Bristers, which kind of surprises me. It says, 16 EC-225s will be back in service by spring or early summer. I'm intrigued about the panel's view. Tim, do you want to take that one? <laughs> Shall I take that one since uh, he's my boss? Um, yes, that, that's not quite what he actually said. Uh, and it, I think the quote has been taken slightly out of context. It was actually uh, a response to a question from a major shareholder in, uh, in Bristow Helicopters on an investor's call, uh, was actually about a week ago, uh, on what his personal opinion was on when the aircraft would be flying. Uh, and his personal view was that, yes, they could easily be flying by, you know, by the summer. Um, that's just an opinion. Um, you know, there is still the process to work through. Um, and as I said before, there's absolutely no pressure on me personally to put these aircraft back flying again or on our company. Um, we're not hurting financially from it. Uh, we're not hurting commercially. Is everyone sort of sharing the pain? Um, so there is, there's no direct pressure on us from our customers or from anybody else to actually go back flying before we're all happy to do it safely. So that's the process that we're, you know, we're committed to and that we're, uh, we're happy to work with. Um, so, yes, it, it might be summer, it might be summer next year, mm -hmm. but uh, that's obviously his personal view. Yeah. Can I just add one thing? I actually uh, spoke to Bill Giles on Tuesday afternoon, the day of the article. Uh, it wasn't the most easy conversation, but he, his commitment was until such time as himself, his children and his grandchildren are able to get in this aircraft safely, Bristol won't be flying them. So I think, you know, as the press is often very useful, you have to take it in the context that of, you know, they're trying to fill column inches. Any other questions? Yep. Roger. Is that one? Uh, Roger yep. Clark, AMEC. Uh, what about the other crack and the crack that's in the workforce confidence uh, getting back into the 225s? Okay. The, after the one that went down in 2009, the Catastrophic failure one. It was a video produced to try and rebuild the, the confidence back in the North Sea workforce, like, and and, and to, to to try and sort that crack, like. Well, I, I, I'm Roger, I'll answer it as, as as honestly as I possibly can. The fact is, is that everybody here, uh, step change, the helicopter operators, Eurocopter, fully appreciate that uh, you know we've got a lot of work to do to rebuild confidence. And we're not going to do that by making another commuting to air video. 
the, the reason that we're having an event with 200 plus people here is to make sure you have the very, very best information as it becomes available from literally, you know, and I have to be careful using this, 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 you know, from the horse's mouth, which is perhaps not the best context when you're talking about meat from France, but there we go. But, but, take that one back. I'll take that one back. That's a great one. But, but the reality is, is that, you know, we know there's a journey in building confidence, and, and part of it is the fact sheets, part of it's communication, part of it's sharing the video. But ultimately, you will all have to get to the point where you make your own decisions whether, you know, this, this is the right and, and, and proper process. But having had the reps in France and, and you know, having had, I mean, Jake in France as well, we, we've seen the commitment that's going in. We have confidence that we're moving forward. But we also are fully aware we're not at the end of that. I mean, yeah, can I just add, I mean, there are a lot of checks and balances in, in this process. Um, you know, there are, it starts with internal teams in Eurocopter, which challenge, which are there to challenge uh, the engineers. It passes through. Uh, the use of <coughs> independent companies and uh, expert validators. Um, there are stakeholders, you know, you're sitting in the room, uh, our customers, our customers' customers, uh, the traveling passengers, um, the authorities, um, European Aviation Safety Authority, the AEIB, the UK Air Accident Investigation Board, um, the UK CAA, um, there are a lot of stakeholders and a lot of people that do need to be convinced. Um, but I hope that if we align the authorities, um, if we align with the offshore experts, the HSSG, um, if we agree on recommendations and safety measures, then I hope that that will send a, a strong signal of confidence to, uh, to the passengers. Um, and to the pilots, I mean, we will brief pilots as well, we are briefing pilots as well, that, you know, we share a common goal. We share a common goal, and that is the safe return of the EC-225 to offshore operations. In the meantime, our commitment as a company is to be transparent, is to be open, is to um, show you the level of commitment and engagement and dedication to safety that we have in our company. Um, and I'm not sure what more we can do, but if you have ideas, then I'm more than willing to hear them. Um, if there are events, uh, tools, processes, which will help people to have their confidence restored, then we, need to, we the industry, need to employ them because we are all in this boat together and we all need to row in the same direction. Okay, we've got, we've got time for two more questions, so I have two hands up, so there we go. On you go. Uh, Steve Foster, NSCO 102 Safety Rep. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Eurocopter how they managed to monitor um, the helicopter's uh, maintenance records for your manufacturers, uh, limitations and everything like that? Is there uh, any way you do that? Um, it's Eurocopter's obligation is to produce um, maintenance procedures which are then applied by the maintenance, approved maintenance organizations. So the, sh the, the short answer to your question is it's not Eurocopter's accountability to monitor the maintenance that's performed by the operators. The oper each operator or each maintenance organization has to be approved under a so-called Part 145 um, approval by the Aviation Authority and the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK is the organization which approves maintenance organization and not only approves it but approves the quality management system, approves the, tech, the, um, the, um, the qualification of the individual technicians and audits regularly uh, the operators. So the application of the maintenance procedures is the responsibility of the maintenance organization, and that's, account, that's, um, uh, that's approved by the Aviation Authority. Now, I'd just like to give you one more example of that. I am personally the head 
of the Eurocopter Maintenance Organization. So that helicopters that are sent to my organization to be maintained, just as those that might be maintained on a regular basis in Tim's organization, um, they are maintained under my part 145, which in my case, because it's in France, uh, is approved by the French uh, Civil Aviation Authority. I am the accountable manager for that, um, for that approval. What does that mean? That means that I am personally, not corporately, personally liable for the maintenance that takes place in my organization. I, I say that again, I am not corporately liable, I am personally liable, which means that if there is a maintenance error, the um, authorities, which may include the police, um, if there is reason to doubt uh, the appropriate application of maintenance, come to me personally. Um, and that's true in the operators, maintenance organizations as well. Each, uh, Bond, Bristow, CHC, each of them have a head of maintenance. Um, and he has a very, very personal stake in ensuring that maintenance is properly, um, properly applied. And we, accountable managers, and I think you probably have them in your industry as well in other regards, accountable managers take their accountability very, very seriously. Because we go to jail if we don't. Um, and uh, it doesn't make me lose sleep at night, but it does make me ensure that my quality management system, the level of the training of my technicians, and the quality of the maintenance that is performed, I take a very, very close uh, regard of, of all of that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Just one last question, please. Gentlemen, you're clear? Hi. In, in the middle. Oh. Oh. Over here. Here I am. Oh, okay, Derek, we're going nice to ask you and Giles, how do the AAIB and the CAA interface with you? Is your investigation the investigation, or do the AAIB have a separate sort of parallel line that's going along? I ask you because they have to say yes at the end, and we'll all hear yes. Of, of course, we, we, we are part of the uh, official investigation with the UK AIB, and we have some people which are appointed in the official investigation. Uh, UK AIB uh, has uh, a lot of uh, competent people, but they don't have uh, 100 uh, engineers uh, able to, to work on such issue. What is important is that practically we exchange every information with the UK AIB, and at the end of the day, a, a, um, UK AAIB will have all the information that we have, and they will be responsible to release the findings of the investigation. And we have regular meeting with them, regular conf call, and practically, then now there will be always UK AIB, BEA, the French also, which are, who are uh, in the loop, the CA, UK CA, Norway CA, Dan Danish CA, and EASA, of course. So everybody is working together. Uh, and uh, what is important at the end of the day is that everybody is aligned uh, for the, the conclusion of the investigation. Okay. Can I just make two comments, two quick mm -hmm. comments there. Um, the first is that the AIB in this particular case have their own external advisors, which is Kinetic, um, UK company, which I'm sure you, um, you may have heard of. Kinetic was an ex-government department, a scientific uh, department of science, I think it was, and is now a private company. It runs Boscombe Down, the flight test center uh, down in Wiltshire. So the AIB have Kinetic as their independent advisors. And um, just a word on the AIB, the, the Air Accident Investigation Board. You know, as a regulator, you, of course we are all, and you are relying upon the Civil Aviation Authority uh, which has issued the operational directive and which you know, will eventually have to lift the operational directive before the helicopters can go back to flight in Aberdeen. The, the system of aviation o oversight and control is such that even the CAA may not investigate um, accidents and incidents in its own um, domain um, and, and then um, recommend to itself what it should do to improve. So the AIB is actually independent from the Civil Aviation Authority, and its role is to provide independent recommendation to the Civil Aviation Authority as well as to the, the operators. So there are, to say if I could say it like that, several layers of independent valuation, validation that, 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 are, um, that are standard practice in our, in, in our industry.
just I'm going to take this gentleman here because he's had his hand up four or five times. So. Um, Pork party a safety rep on 40s Charlie. Mm. Obviously, with the number of I suppose helicopters out of service and there's no slack in the system, are the oil companies or your client companies? <laughs> helping to reduce the requirements for so many flights, so so many units are getting hammered, as the term I think somebody used. Alan, uh, Tim, do you, do you want to pick that up, Tim? Well, <laughs> um, yes, is the answer to that. Um, I think everybody is, uh, is working together on this one, trying to you know, reschedule flights, um, because you know, there are limited resources available. When there were you know, when there's lots of, uh, of aircraft and crews and people have their own sort of dedicated aircraft, then perhaps the aircraft weren't flying all through the day. Uh, there were some you know, slots available in the middle of the afternoon or some of them just weren't being used because there wasn't the need for it. That's the sort of thing where people are rescheduling flights away from everybody wanting to go first thing in the morning to, to balancing it through the day so that the aircraft and uh, pilots and maintainers that we have available now can do... Uh, and what can spread the job out effectively and, and so that more flights can be achieved. That's the kind of thing that, uh, that we're seeing, certainly. What I will just add is that it's, it's not the remit of, of HSSG, obviously it's helicopter safety, but Oil & Gas UK, who uh, sort of work alongside Step Change, have an operational group looking at the impact of this. So they're, they're monitoring Vantage and, and days offshore, along with flight sharing to ensure that any slack capacity is used and actually compelling their members to, to act in a very, let's say, grown up, joined up way to, to, to continue to maximise the number of people who can get offshore, but ultimately within the, the bounds of safe operating conditions. So, okay. okay, folks, I'm going to bring it to a close there. Uh, I think uh, just a round of applause for our panel there, if you don't mind. I think the <laughs> Uh, just, uh, just in bringing the event to a close, these things don't happen by accident. Uh, they, we have had, you know, the, the commitment for uh, the panel to, to show up to, to Gilles, Derek, Alan, and Tim to come along today and actually give us this, uh, the very latest information, along with uh, Pat and Kenny up the back there that uh, probably stole the show, and you'll all remember them and none of us. But that's that's amazing. so the fact that you know these guys show up and. and actually commit to, to sharing information is, is fundamentally important to moving forward. So thanks very much, guys, for doing that. Uh, also, to, to the Step Change team and, and to Izzy and Claire on the event side, you know, it looks kind of easy when you do this for, for three hours, but they've been working behind the scenes for three or four weeks to make this happen. So I'd just like to acknowledge their, their, their sort of commitment to making these, these events work really, really well. And, uh, and finally, really just to you guys for uh, showing up. Uh, there is absolutely no point in us in a, standing in a room speaking to ourselves. We can do that most days of the week. And uh, it's really, really important that you guys come along and actually, you know, actually take this message forward and, and give us a sense of what we need to do next to, to, to move this agenda item forward and how we progress the situation through to a good conclusion. So I really appreciate you taking the time out to do that today.